her selflessness, and her desire to better those around her. Thank you for being an amazing mother to our three kids and a wonderful wife to me. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Sarah. Thanks so much for caring for our girls and for thinking of such creative ways to help them learn. Oh. Give them a bubble. Lily gives Louisa every opportunity to reach her full potential. I've been found. Now I know what it's like to be my mom 40 years ago. What I appreciate the most about Jane is that she's a very caring person and she's always there to help anyone. It's the way she makes things happen in our family. Whether it's coming up with really fun family activities or coordinating the kids' schedules. My wife, Christina Deli, is one of the best uh, mothers I know and she's an amazing mother to us on Gabriel. Um, is the fact that she's so different from me um, and yet she's perfect um, in every way she's just absolutely perfect for our family and for our children and I am uh, very thankful for that I have been given 10 seconds or less to say what I appreciate most about the mother of my children so I drew a taco because they're awesome Susan, I appreciate your relentless love and patience that you display to Kristen and Jonathan. And I really appreciate how consistent you've been despite the highs and lows of especially these crazy times. Happy Mother's Day to the three moms of my life. My mom, Grace Cho, my wife, Esther Cho, and my sister, Julia Kim. Just want to say happy Mother's Day. Love you guys. I appreciate how we can have such a good time together and laugh together at our crazy kids. Petra, your creativity inspires us to be a blessing to others. So here's to you and all the moms. Happy Mother's Day! Yay! Thank you for being such an awesome mother and loving our son and teaching him well. We're so proud of you and so thankful for you. Hope you have a wonderful day today, sweetie. We love you. What I appreciate most about Lily as a mother is how selfless she is. Happy Mother's Day. What I most appreciate about Jenny, especially as a mom, is that she is so much more relational with the kids than, than I am capable of. You know, whenever it is my turn to put them down to bed, they start grumbling, they start whining. That's the worst. Whereas when it's Jenny's turn to put them down to bed, they literally start cheering. Your graciousness. And it always makes me want to be a better person. And you get pretty okay haircuts too. I love that you love all the things that I love. Our children, the children of ICC, and... How you inspire us and our boys every single day to love more deeply and fully. I appreciate my wife, Emmy, as a mother to our girls, especially during this pandemic. She's working even harder than before with e-learning and I'm really seeing the extent of her patience with them. We know that sometimes it's not easy and sometimes things are a little bit crazy. But we appreciate all that you do and we appreciate all of who you are. We love you. 
Happy Mother's Day, Helen. You're such a wonderful, loving mom to Tyler, and I appreciate you take care of the other kid in the family, me, by making sure I'm well-fed every day. It was delicious, it looked great. I ate it before the video. I eat, it's what I do. Happy Mother's Day, love you. Elizabeth, we appreciate you for being there for us at every moment and for being the glue that holds this family together. We, we love, love you, mom. mom. Mother's Day, Sam.
There is strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our mourning With a love that casts out fear
Good morning, ICC. My name is Paul Kang, and I'll be sharing the prayer focus for this Sunday. Uh, today, we're going to be praying for the scientists and researchers who are working on finding treatments and a vaccine for coronavirus. So would you join me in prayer? Dear God, we thank you for this time today to gather to worship you. Even though we're physically apart during this quarantining period, we thank you that our church is not a building or a location, but a community of believers united not by physical proximity, but by our faith in you. We thank you that your Holy Spirit transcends time and space, and so wherever we are, you are there, and that you hear the prayers of your people. We thank you even for technology, such that we can still gather together virtually to be able to worship you today. Lord, we want to acknowledge that even during this age of scientific innovation and new technology that you are using this pandemic to remind us of the frailty of our lives and our dependence on you. We repent of our self-sufficiency, our pride, and our reliance on our own works to protect us. And we ask for renewed faith and humility. As we hear stories of people falling ill with this virus, we're reminded of and forced to confront the reality of the fallenness of this world. We know that true salvation and the healing of our world and our lives lies only to the work of Jesus on the cross. So would you increase our faith and help us to believe as it is written in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So as we long for the resurrection of our bodies and the eternal weight of glory, we also want to pray for your healing today in the midst of the pandemic. We specifically want to lift up the scientists, clinicians, researchers, and epidemiologists who are working on understanding how the virus spreads and are hard at work in finding treatments and testing mechanisms for the coronavirus. We thank you that you have gifted these people with the knowledge and abilities to fight this virus. And we pray for their endurance and creativity to find therapies that will help protect us against the virus and help treat people who have fallen ill. We also pray for all those patients who are enrolled in clinical trials that you would watch over them as they offer up their bodies to be tested with these experimental therapies. Would you bless the work of all these scientists and patients and use them as a means to bring healing to the devastation that this virus has caused. Also, as today is Mother's Day, we want to lift up all the moms in our congregation to you. Thank you for blessing us with mothers who have loved and cared for us. Would you give them strength when they are tired, patience to deal with the many demands placed upon them, faith to entrust their loved ones ultimately to your care, and deep love for those they nurture. And now as we continue with our worship, would you open up our hearts and our minds to receive your word. In your son's name we pray, amen. I am very thankful for the people who I work with who in these last few weeks have really rallied and stepped out of their comfort levels to uh, do whatever we can to meet the needs of the hospital and the people who come to our doors. I would say that I'm most thankful for my faith. Um, being a physician is difficult as it is, you know, dealing with people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis, but um, with this pandemic, we're dealing with a new virus where there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of anxiety, um, despair, and hopelessness. Um, and for me, I can get up every morning and go to work um, and face these fears and anxieties. During this season, I'm thankful for God's provision, uh, for community, and my wife for putting up with me throughout all of this. With families and dear ones not being allowed into the hospital, my role as a nurse in providing emotional support to my patients has changed dramatically. I find myself spending more time with them and I enjoy getting to know them better. I'm thankful for the support of my family, both near and far, my small group, ICC community and friends. Most thankful for all the support that I've been getting through family, friends and patients. I feel like I'm not going at this alone, but we're working at this together. Um, I see God's work in everyone's hard work, people picking up extra shifts um, and their generosity and their kindness. Uh, even though I can't see their smiles anymore, they're covered up by masks, I can still hear it in their voice. Being a pediatrician and having had met these families many times before, I think uh, especially with the stress that families are dealing with, they're opening up to me in ways that 
I have never imagined before would be possible, whether it's little kids to teenagers to parents as well. Uh, I think they're being honest with me and they're sharing their concerns and, and that is one way that not only is God working now, but I see how God has been preparing uh, these relationships all along so that more vulnerable and deeper questions and conversations can be had. In the last few weeks, I have experienced God innumerable ways. Just last week, I was able to share Psalm 46 with one of my patients at night as she was feeling very low and scared. Praying through the Psalm gave both of us renewed hope. I see God speaking very powerfully through the faces that we see of the people most affected by COVID-19. And I feel that he is asking us to let our hearts be broken by the disparities that already exist, whether it's racial or financially. We are seeing that face to face on the floors by the people most affected by COVID-19. The hospital's been very busy lately. Um, we've been having a surge of cases and um, taking care of COVID patients has been more physically and emotionally draining as well. So please pray that God would give me strength to be able to um, really take care of these patients and to show them compassion and love. Uh, as this pandemic drags on, we're going to need more and more equipment and um, please pray that God will provide. Thank you. Um, and my prayer is that we continue to see God's truth in all of this and what it is that he's trying to reveal to us. The prayer I ask for is for the people who are in the hospital that don't make the headlines. Many of these people don't have COVID-19. Many of them do too, but we do have several people um, every week who are dying in the hospital or critically ill. And the hardest part is that they are not allowed to have visitors. And so the people who would most be able to comfort them are not there. So my prayer is that God would give us healthcare workers, whether it's pharmacists, nurses, doctors, therapists, um, the compassion and the creativity that we need to really show these people that they are not alone. I am talking with all ages about the anxieties that they have related to the pandemic. And, and, and I need a lot of wisdom in talking to all the different age ranges, from little toddlers to uh, elementary school children, or even for you know high schoolers or people who are going off to college. Uh, there are these different concerns that they have, and, and sometimes I have to have the right mindset as I talk to each age range. My prayer request is for the world, our country, recovery of our economy, and frontline workers and our families as they are in constant danger of being inadvertently exposed to the virus. Please also pray for my mother who is battling terminal cancer for the past eight months. If the Lord wills, I would like to go and visit her once more. Thank you ICC for everything. Good morning, ICC. It's uh, really great to hear the testimonies from our members who are on the front lines of this coronavirus crisis. We talk about the bravery of first responders like police and firefighters who run into the direction of danger uh, when others are fleeing from it in order to help others and to keep us safe. And our healthcare workers are doing that for us during this crisis. They are regularly exposing themselves to COVID-19 in order to help those who are in greatest need. And so let's continue to keep them in prayer as we 
uh, as well as even encouraging you to send out personal words of, enc- of encouragement to uh, our healthcare workers as they uh, continue to battle this virus. I also want to echo the sentiments of the other husbands in the video at the start of our service and express my deepest appreciation for Betty, who is the mother in our home. And uh, throughout this crisis, one of the things I've come to realize is that she really is the glue that keeps our family together. Um, I personally tend to have a lot of loner tendencies and can so easily get lost for hours uh, at my desk, totally absorbed by my own work or my interests and projects that I'm doing. Uh, but Betty is the one that keeps calling us to be a family, and whether it's to watch a show together or uh, to go out for ice cream together or to do a puzzle. And so it's been something that's been a real revelation to me of how basically she is the one that really makes our family a family uh, during this Uh, coronavirus crisis. Uh, I also want to thank my own mother on this Mother's Day. Uh, She has also played such a pivotal role in shaping me, uh, really since childhood, to make me the person that I've become. And so, really on this Mother's Day, I want to say a thank you to all of you moms who are out there for everything that you do, uh, and to really say that family just wouldn't be family without you. The other day, someone in our neighborhood uh, asked in a bit of a panic what this loud siren was that they were hearing uh, outside that morning. Uh, Was he supposed to do something? Was this some kind of an emergency? And he didn't know that on the first Tuesday of every month at 10 a.m., our town tests the emergency warning siren. And though he had lived in the neighborhood for years, he had never heard that siren before because... Uh, At that time of the month, he was always at work. Uh, But because of this stay-at-home order, he heard it for the first time. And I think this is just one among many stories that illustrate all the ways that our normal rhythms have been totally disrupted because of this pandemic. We've been monitoring the situation very closely every week as a church staff uh, to see basically what the latest developments are, and to try to figure out how it is going to impact ICC. Even though healthcare experts say that most regions in the U.S. really aren't equipped at this time for the necessary wide-scale testing or the contact tracing uh, that is needed, a number of states have already started to move to relaxing some of the social distancing measures that have been in place for the last six or seven weeks. The most current projections uh, by the epidemiologists are indicating that this coronavirus will be a reality that all of us are going to have to live with for many more months to come. And the real turning point in fighting this virus isn't likely to come until we've actually reached uh, what's known as herd immunity, uh, either by Uh, enough people being infected by the virus or through the availability of a vaccine. And that vaccine, experts tell us, won't be available till next summer at the earliest. It's hard to predict what all of this is going to mean for us as a church. But it's likely that we will be able to resume smaller scale meetings like community groups or leaders meetings before we can even think about starting up Sunday worships again. And uh, even once we do resume in-person Sunday worship, uh, at first anyway, it's very likely that we're going to have to do so on a much more scaled-down basis in order to still maintain the social distancing guidelines. One of the scenarios that very well may be possible is that we may need to set up some kind of a rotation where a number of families can come worship in person here in the sanctuary each week uh, while we live stream the service for the rest of you who are worshiping at home. Uh, But at the end of the day, we just really don't know what's going to happen in the weeks and the months that are to come. And so let's all be praying together as we seek God's wisdom and how to best respond Uh, week to week, month to month to this crisis. In fact, why don't we pray together right now? Father, as we uh, celebrate this Mother's Day, um, 
under these circumstances, we um, realize that we don't get to do the normal traditions of maybe going out to a restaurant and enjoying a good meal together like that. And yet, nevertheless, even on, uh, in the midst of this crisis, we want to celebrate the great gift that you've given to us for the mothers in our life. We thank you for the way that they so tirelessly serve the family and the way that they pour out their lives uh, in so many different ways, both seen and unseen, uh, to care for us. And so we pray, especially on this day, that you would uh, bless them and strengthen them and enable them to continue to faithfully do the work that they're doing on our behalf. May you pour into them so that they can pour into others. We pray for this worship this day, though we are all separated physically in our own homes. Unite us together in one spirit around the teaching of your word and worship to you. And so as we do that, open our hearts to understanding what you want to say to us this morning as we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. So a few weeks ago, as you know, I began a, this brief mini-series inviting uh, all of you into these moments of solitude and silence and wanting to use this stay-at-home order as basically an invitation by God to spend time with Him, listening for His voice. And that first week, I asked you to reflect on Jesus' invitation to live for the things that really matter, the, the, what we call the deeper life. Uh, and I also asked you to think about the way that life in the suburbs uh, seems to often pull us in the exact opposite direction of that deeper life that Christ wants for us. In his book, Death by Suburb, Dave Getz illustrates the way that the values of life in the suburbs can creep into our hearts. And he writes, The last time my wife, wife Jana and I purchased a home, we decided beforehand how much we could spend. Then, in the process of securing a loan, we learned that technically we could afford uh, much more than what we had agreed upon. The bigger is better argument made good sense. Your income will rise, so your payments will eventually be easier to make. Plus, property is a good investment. There's a, little, there's a limited supply of land. It will always go up. When the real estate agent drove us around to look at homes, I read between the lines, you don't want to buy in this neighborhood, meaning you can afford more, move up, move up, uh, up a level. A volcano of insecurity began to erupt. We'll never get a house we really like. I need to make more money. It hurts when you can't buy the house you think you need. Why do I feel as if I'll never have enough? Why am I oblivious to much of what I have, except that which is just out of reach? I hesitate to call this chronic emotional state evil because doing so feels like vitiating the horrible atrocities that play out on the world stage each day. But could it be, could this obsession with the good life just out of my grasp be a covert manifestation of evil in my life? Who will ask me the real questions? Will buying this house honor God? Will it give me a sense of peace? Or will it add to your stress? This is the subtle poison that can enter into our spiritual bloodstream. Living for the same things and chasing after the same dreams that the world lives for and chases after. We're all so anxious to go back to our normal lives, but during this crisis, you should be asking yourself, what should normal look like for me once this crisis is over? What are the changes that you need to make in order to enter into the deeper life that Jesus invites you to? Last week, I talked about how from a young age, all of us developed the skill of creating a false self. A version of ourselves that is better than we actually are. We learn how to do and say the right things that will win others' approval, even if it doesn't truly represent who we are on the inside. Initially, we create this false self to deceive others, but in the end, we end up believing our own lie. And that makes it incredibly hard 
to see ourselves as we truly are. As long as we hide behind our false self, we feel only a little guilty for our sins. Our false self, in fact, stands up pretty well against any accusations that are made against us, even if those accusations come from God Himself. That's why true repentance requires us to see our false self. So that like the Apostle Paul, we can honestly confess the depth of our sin struggle. Romans chapter 7, verse 19 and verse 24, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. It is only when we can deal honestly with our sin that we can move to the real growth and transformation into Christ-likeness that God desires for us. Well, as we come into another week, I want to continue to encourage you to seek these moments of solitude and silence during this COVID-19 crisis. But this week, I want to invite you to reflect on the ways that your faith is expressed in loving and serving others. Matthew 16, 24 to 25, we read this verse last week. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Last week I pointed out how uh, the call to a crucified life is a call to die to self. And that means putting, on, putting to death the sinful patterns that wage war within our hearts. But another aspect of dying to ourselves is also a call to surrender our rights for the service and the benefit of others in our life. And Jesus himself powerfully demonstrated this aspect of the crucified life when he washed the disciples' feet. In John chapter 13, verse 12 to 12 to 15, it says, When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your te- Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Jesus makes it very clear that what he had done for his disciples was to stand for them as an example, that they should also do the same thing for one another. But you know, it's scary how self-absorbed and how self-centered we can become as Christians. Claiming all of the promises of God for ourselves and praying for His favor in our lives. And yet missing this fundamental character of the Christian life. To live not for our sakes, but for the sake of others. You know, this morning I want to look at this parable of the Good Samaritan to help us Understand the kind of attitude that God desires of us, as well as to expose the type of attitudes that are more instinctive in us when it comes to loving and serving others. And in order to understand this parable, we have to realize what the context of it is. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to 26, it says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? The telling of the story was prompted by an expert of the law who asked Jesus what he must do to inherit eternal life. Often the Jewish leaders seemed to be approaching Jesus with sincere questions of faith, but they almost always had darker motives underneath. And so as he often did, Jesus replied to this question with a question of his own. Why don't you tell me what the answer is? And so the expert of the law answered in verses 12, I mean verse 27 to 28. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. 
You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. It was a good answer. It was the right answer. And Jesus acknowledged that. But then his real motive is revealed in his next question. In verse 29, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In other words, he asked Jesus to define for him what neighbor is as a way to try to justify the way that he was already living out this command in his life. And so in response to that, Jesus tells him the story. In verse 30 to 37, it says, In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. In this parable, there's this man that is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho a route that was notorious for its danger. He is attacked by robbers. He is stripped and beaten and left for dead on the roadside. And eventually, a priest passes by and veers to the opposite side of the road in order to avoid getting involved with the scene. And then a Levite passes by and does the exact same thing, walking on the opposite side of the road to avoid the scene of the crime. And the teacher of the law would have immediately understood the moral dilemma that these men were facing because both the priest and the Levite were servants of the temple. And they would have been in trouble if they came in contact with a dead person. It would have made them ceremonially unclean. And so here is this body laying on the roadside, dead, unconscious, who knows? But how could they tell without coming into contact with a body? In fact, even coming within four feet of a dead body would have made them unclean. And if it turned out that he, in fact, was dead, then they had just made themselves unclean for no reason disqualifying themselves from serving at the temple. And so faced with this dilemma, both men make this cold-hearted calculation not to get involved. And regardless of this issue of ceremonial purity, it's hard to stomach the behavior of these two men, isn't it? How could they act so heartlessly to someone in such dire need? And the teacher of the law to whom Jesus told this parable would have felt the exact same way. It's interesting that Jesus chose a Levite and a priest to be the villains of his story. You know, we tend to lump all religious leaders of that time into one big group as if they were all in bed together. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law didn't really get along with the priests and the others who served at the temple in Jerusalem. They saw them, in fact, as a power-hungry upper class who were politically motivated and actually spiritually bankrupt. But now, Jesus turns the tables on this teacher of the law. The third person who arrives on the scene that day is not a Pharisee, as that expert in the law would have expected, but a Samaritan. And in light of the audience that Jesus was speaking to, he couldn't have chosen a more offensive hero 
for his story. Because the Jews hated the Samaritans. They were a mixed race that was the product of years ago when Jews intermarried with Gentiles. This hatred for them was so great that there are records of Jewish prayers during that time, petitioning God not to grant salvation to any Samaritans. I mean, how much do you have to hate a group of people to actually pray against their salvation? Remember what triggered Jesus to tell this parable. An expert of the law wanted to justify himself. And the way that he tried to do this is by asking Jesus, define this term neighbor for me. In other words, really, he wanted to justify his lack of loving his neighbor by this loophole of narrowly defining who a neighbor was. After all, if somebody is not my neighbor, then I don't have to love them. And so whether it was in the name of religion, this whole thing about ceremonial cleanliness, or frankly, whether it was the result of outright racism, they excluded anyone that they didn't want to love from this definition of, quote, being a neighbor. This is religion. At its worst, it is interpreting God's commands to suit our own preferences and, in doing so, basically reshaping God in our own image. And so, Jesus uses the story of the Good Samaritan to reveal how far this man is from the heart of God. And the truth is, all of us are guilty of this sin. All of us pick and choose who we want to love, how we narrowly define who our neighbor is. And sadly, I think the truth is, most of us don't feel all that guilty about this either. You know, there was this experiment done with Princeton Seminary students who were asked to prepare a talk on this parable of the Good Samaritan. And after reporting to a particular building, They were sent to a different location on campus where they were supposed to present that talk to a group of people. And on this route, the researchers stationed a person in an alleyway that they knew these students would have to walk through. And this person was told to roll around on the ground groaning in pain, making it absolutely clear that he was in dire need of help. And they wanted to see how many seminarians would actually stop to help him out. And the sad thing was that the majority of these students stepped around and some even stepped over this man so that they wouldn't be hindered from presenting their paper on the Good Samaritan. The irony of that is staggering, isn't it? And I think All of us imagine that if we were subjects in that experiment, that we would have been in that minority who would have stopped and helped this guy out. But are you so sure? Because I think the truth is, all of us are capable of this kind of callous, calculated, cold-heartedness toward those in need. All of us have this incredible capacity to compartmentalize our lives so that we don't actually feel all that guilty about our indifference toward the suffering of others. After all, who is my neighbor? You know, during my years living as a missionary in Kenya, my heart was just constantly weighed down by the endless need that we encountered there. I, I can't think of almost a single day that went by without somebody coming to my office at the hospital and asking me for some kind of assistance or another. And even at our home, people from the village who knew that we were missionaries would regularly knock on our door and ask for help at all hours of the day. A woman who didn't have enough money to purchase 
uh, for uh, a, a surgical procedure that she needed. A father who needed money to pay for his son's school fees. A pastor who asked for my help to rescue a teenage girl who had run away from home because her family was going to forcibly circumcise her. And how can you say no to requests like that? And so as much as possible, we tried to help every one of them that we could during our years there. But here's the thing. Once we moved back to America, I was struck by how sheltered our life suddenly became out here in the suburbs. Surrounded by beautifully kept subdivisions, top-rated school districts, shopping malls, coffee shops, gyms, and movie theaters. I realized how insulated we are from so much of the need and pain that fills our world. In other words, if you choose not to, you almost never have to be confronted by things like poverty or gang activity or human trafficking and prostitution. Listen, I don't want to make light of the struggles that you may be going through. But I think all of us need to acknowledge that suburban living is intentionally designed to keep so much of the systemic brokenness of our world outside of its walls. The truth is this, though. We cannot help everyone who is in need. I mean, we realized that sobering fact as missionaries in Africa. But the truth, that truth is everywhere, no matter where we live. The need is endless. And it can be overwhelming to try to take on the burdens of others around us. But through this parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus tells this teacher of the law, you're asking the wrong question. Rather than asking, who is my neighbor? You ought to be asking, how do I become the kind of person who can truly love my neighbor like the Samaritan? In other words, how do I become the kind of good neighbor that will love others selflessly? My fear is this. My fear is that because we can't help everyone, we end up helping no one. And the reality is that it gets messy when you try to help somebody in need. Unlike the clean, convenient boundary lines that this teacher of the law drew around his love for others by the way that he defined who a neighbor was, Things got really messy and complicated for the Samaritan once he decided to get involved. After bandaging this man's wounds, he realized that he couldn't just leave this guy on the roadside. And so he puts him on his own donkey, which means he has to walk because there's only one seat on this ride. And he brings him to an inn where he could be looked after. And after paying the innkeeper to look after him while he attends to his own business... He is committed now. And so after his affairs are done, he will come back, he says, and settle any other further costs that are incurred in the care for this man and make sure that he's going to be okay. I mean, where does it end, right? Where does it end? And I think it's precisely this messiness that causes so many of us to choose not to get involved with other people's problems. And I think the truth is this. The only way that we can follow the example of this Good Samaritan is if God does a work in our hearts. We can't just grit our teeth and force ourselves to do this. When we look at the story of the Good Samaritan, we see that he did not do this out of duty or obligation. But unlike the Levite and the priest, what the story tells us is that when the Samaritan looked at this man lying for half dead on the roadside, he was filled with compassion. In other words, his heart was moved 
to act and to love this person that he didn't even know. God must first do a work in our hearts if we're going to be able to love others like this. And I think we can only love others like that when we realize that this is how God loves us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because He first loved us. Until we realize that we ourselves are that man that was on that roadside lying dead. And that Christ Himself was our Good Samaritan who cared for us and bandaged our wounds and brought us to full healing until we realize that we were first the ones who received that mercy. We don't have the strength nor the desire to offer that same mercy and love to others. I think one of the great dangers as we go through this COVID-19 pandemic is that it can really put into overdrive our self-preservation instincts. I mean, that's been clearly on display in our stores, hasn't it? I mean, I was just blown away when I went to the store to buy some food and just saw entire aisles in my grocery store completely cleared as everyone just grabbed for everything they could, thinking, well, I'm going to get it before it runs out and other people take it. But a lot has been written about the way that Christians have responded historically to past pandemics that killed far more people than this current pandemic is projected to do. A Lyman Stone writes about that as he reflects on the Christian response to previous pandemics. And he says, This habit of sacrificial care has reappeared throughout history. In 1527, when the bubonic plague hit Wittenberg, Martin Luther refused calls to flee the city and protect himself. Rather, he stayed and ministered to the sick. The refusal to flee cost his daughter, Elizabeth, her life. But it produced a tract entitled, Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague, where Luther provides a clear articulation of a Christian epidemic response. We die at our posts. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. The plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them to crosses on which we must be prepared to die. These are heavy words, aren't they? But I think they are valid words for us in this crisis. Like first responders, when others are running away from danger and doing everything that they can to protect themselves and their loved ones. As Christians, we ought to be thinking about how we can love our neighbor. And that doesn't mean just those who are related to us by blood or the people that we care about. But it also ought to mean everyone around us that we can do good to. How can we maybe even at times run in the direction of danger to show love to our neighbor. You know, one of the ways that we can respond is by giving to a special benevolence fund that the elders have created for this COVID-19 crisis. Uh, And so right now, Pastor Peter is going to share with you a bit about what this fund is all about. So as Pastor Steve mentioned, um, as elders, we have been actively assessing how we can best serve you in this uh, time of need and how you may be able to serve others as well. And as you know, this pandemic has put a lot of people in very difficult financial positions and really through no fault of their own. And uh, by the grace of God, you know, we've been blessed with a very strong balance sheet and we have healthy reserves. And we feel that even though our giving is down in recent months, we are in a position to help those in need in this unprecedented season. So right now we're in the process of revising our 2020 budget Um, We have been able to reduce some costs because we're not meeting in person at this time, and we're hoping to increase our benevolence fund significantly. So if anyone in our church is struggling to cover basic living expenses like food, mortgage, or rent, utilities, or transportation, or unexpected medical bills, uh, our desire is really to help as many people as possible. 
Uh, if you are not in a position of need and the Lord has blessed you so that you can bless others, we want to invite you to, to make a contribution beyond your regular tithe into our Benevolence Fund. And we'll be sending out an email later today with details on this policy and, and the process and, and on how to request from this fund as well as how to also give into this fund. And so uh, we, the thing we want you to know is that we want to make this as painless and uh, a process as possible and just as dignified as possible for you. And so to request help, all you have to do is fill out a very simple four-question application online by texting ICC Help uh, to 95577, or you can email help at emmanuelcommunity.org to schedule a phone call with an elder, and we can get all the info we need within a five-minute phone conversation or so. Okay, no one else in the church uh, will know your identity or your situation except for the elders. So again, if you find yourself in a position of need, let us serve you in this way. And if you would like to join the church in serving in this way as well, please uh, consider doing so and join us. Now, if you have any questions about this, feel free to contact me at peter at emmanuelcommunity.org or our finance deacon John Ho at um, finance at emmanuelcommunity.org. Okay, thank you. You know, I've been so encouraged by a number of you who have reached out to me uh, during this COVID-19 crisis, asking about how you might be able to financially assist families here at ICC who may be economically struggling. And uh, that just really warmed my heart to see that love that you initiated uh, without even being prompted to do so. And I think many, I hope that many of you will consider giving to this fund. And if you are one of those families in need right now and you're going through economic hardship, uh, I pray that you would reach out to us and to seek the help that's available through this fund. There are other ways that you can apply this sermon during these weeks of crisis. Maybe one of the things that you can do is just simply check in on your neighbors. Uh, one of my pastor friends has been sharing how uh, he's lived in this neighborhood for decades, but he really hadn't gotten to know some of the neighbors on his street. But during this pandemic, he's just been taking prayer walks all through his neighborhood and just waving and saying hi to his neighbors. And that has actually sparked some really uh, meaningful conversations with them and even with one neighbor that has asked for his prayers. Another thing that you might be able to do to uh, show love to your neighbor during this crisis is to give blood to uh, the Red Cross and to other agencies. Uh, the blood banks are reporting unprecedented shortages in their blood supply, and they've created protocols where you can give in a very safe environment. All you have to do is go to redcrossblood.org and just type in your zip code, and it will give you a list of all of the blood drives that are ongoing in a near driving distance from you. I know that even some in our church have been sewing masks and giving them away, and I think that's another wonderful way to serve uh, others in this time of crisis. And as I shared at the beginning of the message, maybe one of the things you could do is encourage the healthcare workers who continue to fight on the front lines of this uh, crisis, helping those who are in need. I, I think there are just so many different ways that we can show love to our neighbor during this crisis. And so, as you spend some more time in solitude and silence, maybe in this week, you could really spend some time reflecting on the ways in which maybe your faith has become very self-focused, self-serving even. And maybe you will hear the Spirit of God challenging you to be more selfless, to find ways in which you can love your neighbor during this crisis, even at personal risk and cost to yourself. What would it be for me, what would it mean for me to carry my cross? to live the crucified life and love others as Christ loves me. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that through the work of your Spirit, you would challenge all of us during this time of crisis to grow beyond our self-centered pursuit after our own safety and to make sure that we and our loved ones are looked after above every other priority. And I pray that we as your people who are called by your name would rise up during this crisis 
and maybe even at times run into the direction of danger and harm when everyone else is running in the other direction, sharing limited resources with those who are in need, even though that may put at risk our own stock of those same resources, and giving freely and selflessly of our time, our energy, even our finances in order to help those who are in greater need than we are. And so, Lord, do that work in our heart and cause your love, your compassion, your mercy to rise up in our own hearts that in the midst of this, we could stand as your witnesses and bear the example of your love to those around us. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. receive the benediction. May you have the power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ for you. And in the knowledge of that love, may God give you compassion for others so that you can see them through his eyes and love them selflessly and sacrificially. Amen.